I want to talk about cinema and all its friends and cousins and relatives, but I want to talk about it very much in association with this provocative statement that is on the screen. I come from the same place as Monty Python. So you must expect a certain amount of irony, a certain amount of anarchy, but certainly an openness, if you like, towards the notions of the things that we hope to discuss. I have been given, I think, about an hour and 20 minutes, and then there's sufficient space at the end where we will open up, if you feel you want to, away from a monologue from me to some sort of dialogue. And maybe that's the time when it should get really interesting. So what I want to do is to talk a bit, show you some cinema, talk a bit more, show you some more cinema, A, B, A, B, A, B, till I sense you're all getting very bored and want to go home, and therefore I will stop and we'll open it up for a discussion. But what I don't really want to talk about very much is, I suppose, the cinema that in general terms that I'm associated with, which used to be called European Art Cinema. European Art Cinema now is dead. It's finished. The two big movements, I suppose, of the end of the 20th century would have been the Nouvelle Bar, basically Belgian and French, and of course that extraordinary period of Italian cinema that probably begins with La Dolce Vita and probably finishes with The Last Emperor. So each of these periods last between 15 to 23 years and created really for an extraordinary amount of really exciting, inventive, anarchic, revolutionary cinema. But the world has changed and it doesn't exist anymore. Very difficult for me actually to make a judgment of where you think that Argentinian cinema exists. Do you think, like very much part, I suppose, of your total cultural civilization, it is post-European, or is it very, very independent? Is there such a thing as an independent Argentinian cinema that is autonomous and only relative to people like you? That's not a rhetorical question. I need to hear an answer. Do you think there is an autonomous Argentinian cinema? You haven't got it. You don't have earphones. Why do we have simultaneous translation and you do not have earphones? Can somebody rectify this situation? Do everybody in the audience who feels they do not speak English should surely have earphones. Can I have an answer to that? Aren't there loads and loads of earphones outside I saw in the room outside? No? Why are we spending expensive money getting a translator who you can't hear? <laughs> Maybe that's a sort of... Is, is, is that some sort of Argentinian trick, is it? <laughs> All right, well, for those people then who don't understand me, at least admit it, there will be some pictures. But... I suppose there is. Uh, maybe, maybe you can. Here's one of my minders here. Can you explain why they don't have earphones and we have translation? So, as I've suggested, I don't really want to talk that much about, I suppose, the cinema that I'm normally associated with, which is this phenomenon that used to be called European art cinema, which I presume has had an influence here in Argentina. Um, I suppose 
the film that most people associate me with, certainly back, I suppose, in Europe and North America, would be a movie called The Cook, the Thief, His Wife and Her Lover. And can I ask you, has anybody in the audience seen that film? Yes. 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 Okay, that gives you a sort of idea of, I suppose, middle 1980s European art cinema, which in a sense, of course, is related to worldwide cinema, certainly American cinema, although there are ways and means and perspectives that create a difference between, indeed, that film and the other films we've talked about. But there is a way that there are sorts of financing situation, which essentially comes, I suppose, from the cinema establishment itself, which um, tends to make a certain sort of cinema, which maybe some of you are interested in, and certainly I suppose it provides the, the money and it creates the audiences, but really what fascinates me is maybe a certain sort of cinema which is different, and it's certainly funded differently. So most of the films that I'm going to show you this evening are not funded that way, but are organized and distributed and paid for by essentially art institutions, art galleries, museums, private people who perhaps are interested in something which I always call cinema, cinema. That is to say, making an approach to something which is intrinsically cinematic. The funding of these uh, opportunities necessarily, of course, don't have huge Spielberg-type audiences. But then I don't think that I could possibly make a Spielberg even if I was given 100 million pounds. Um, I ought to make an explanation from that because Initially, my career was created relative to my education as a painter. I always, always wanted, and still do, wish to regard the notion of painting as the superior visual art, should we say, of the Western world. An Italian journalist asked me several months ago, how is it, Mr. Greenaway, that you started your career as a painter and now you're a filmmaker. And I gave the rather glib answer that I was always unhappy that paintings did not have soundtracks. <laughs> so maybe I don't make cinema, maybe I attempt to make, I suppose, versions of paintings with soundtracks. But that obviously cannot be the whole of the answer. But I do think that contemporary cinema, I suppose, could be said to be very impoverished by the fact that really contemporary cinema is not really about images, it's really about text. You people in this audience have never seen a film that did not start life as a text. The obvious answer is, of course, Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. These are not films. These are illustrated texts. Mm. It's a very obvious situation because you can go down the marketplace and you can buy these books. And there's a way, okay, that Mr. Tolkien is not alive, but the author of Harry Potter certainly is. So in a sense, these are present tense bookshop texts. Now, the cinema knows that it's not very good at organizing its content, but it always goes back to the bookshop. So, in a melancholy moment, I could say that none of you have seen any cinema. All you've seen is 120 years, that's 1895 to 2015, nice round number, 120 years. All you've ever seen is 120 years of illustrated text. And that again, I would venture, along, I think, with some great luminaries of cinema history, as not being cinema at all, let me repeat again, it's the question of illustrated text, which is another thing entirely. I am, of course, deeply, deeply prejudiced because I'm trained as a painter, and I certainly believe that painting is the most sophisticated thing that anybody can do. 
Everybody in this room is wearing underpants and is wearing socks. Underpants and socks have to be designed. Everything man-made has to be designed, and the chief designers of all this phenomenon have to be painters. It's a big trickle-down effect. Let me give you another anecdote. You might have heard of Giacometti, who is a painter and a sculptor, Swiss-Italian. Giacometti said that probably your grandmothers know nothing about Picasso, but be absolutely certain that Picasso knows everything about your grandmother. <laughs> In her kitchen, she probably has curtains which have a geometric design, of maybe some abstract quality. She wouldn't know that Picasso, in a sense, was responsible for those curtains. But Picasso knew Utrillo, and Utrillo knew Joe Bloggs, and Joe Bloggs knew five, six, seven other people that made a cultural chain between Picasso at the top of the chair, if you like, all the way down to your grandmother. So the triple-down effect of our visual education is essentially made responsible by painters. I think that most people, because of this sort of activity, are visually illiterate. Do you think, this is not a rhetorical question, do you think that you're all visually literate? Put your hands up here. I know you're all part of a university, but I think the university is very much geared, shall we say, to a scientific education, and is not particularly associated with the visual arts. Am I correct? Am I correct? Who in this room has had an art education? Yes, put your hands up very high so I can count you. Okay, let's add those people who've been to some sort of design school, or maybe, maybe um, architectural college. Put your hands up again. <laughs> Hmm, not bad, not bad. So I would think that probably only about 10% of the audience in this room could regard themselves as visually literate. Let me expand on that. And please believe it's not your fault. It's to do with the education system of the world. You know, when you're about 9, 10, 11, 12, your teacher says, put away the crayons, put away the paints, Put away the easel, you now have to get serious. This is the gap between primary school education and secondary school education. So most people do that because the common feeling is that making pictures does not make money. That's the common feeling. You know, at 9, 10, 11, 12, you have to start getting serious. You have to become tech sophisticated in order that you can pay the mortgage and you can pay the grocery bill. But what does that mean? I understand that all of you here in this room have a life expectancy of 80 years. We certainly do in Europe. So that means from the age of 10 to the age of 80, 70 years, you're probably going to have no connection with the images. You're going to have no ability or desire, indeed, to paint and manipulate those images which makes for a very barren and impoverished life. Not only for the sheer sensuous activity of being able to express your thoughts in images, but very, very relevant to a 21st century world. Think of the digital revolution and how potentially visual it is. It is an irony that I'm certainly aware of that I, as a filmmaker, cannot go to a producer or a film studio with four paintings, three prints, and a book of drawings and say, give me the money. They won't know what I'm talking about. Most producers, are there any producers in the room? Because I'm about to insult you. <laughs> Most producers are visually illiterate. They need a text. They need something written. And if that text has already been successful in the marketplace, like Harry Potter, then they're overjoyed. 
Isn't it amazing? We have a cinema which is meant to be about pictures. But the only way it's manifest, the only way it works, is by illustrating a text to make those pictures. Which you can see without me elaborating any more how very, very impoverishing that is. I've often thought that if we are all going to have a successful visual education, then cinema could very well be an ideal way to make that happen. But looking at the state of world cinema now, I don't think the two ideas match up. I think that's very, very disappointing, very, very, I suppose, disconcerting. But I think, you know, it's a bit late to do anything about it now, because cinema is dead. Don't waste your time anymore worrying about cinema giving you a visual education, because essentially after 120 years, it is no more. Now you're all shaking your heads. That man there shook his head just then. Somebody else giggled, because I think probably at heart you don't believe what I said. Let me give you two examples. Is there anybody in this room who still looks at silent cinema? You know, apart from Buster Keaton, or Mickey Mouse, or Charlie Chaplin at Christmas time, maybe you do that. Or maybe there are some academics who want to know what look Chicago trams looked like in 1921 and look at the black and white film as an archival source. Anybody in the room that does that? Is there actually anybody in this room who looks at silent cinema for general education and general entertainment? There's one man there very keen to tell me that he does. <laughs> But you know, somebody calculated there are something like 30 million silent films all over the world from 1895 to 1929. 30 million films. They're awful lot of films. But most of them are not looked at anymore. It's gone. The phenomenon is gone. And I feel that sound cinema will go exactly the same way and go exactly the same way very quickly. I'm sure my great-grandchildren will say, cinema? What was that? <laughs> That's one example, the death, if you like, or the unseeability of silent movies, which has passed on by. The other thing is you might know that there is in Hollywood a very popular film magazine called Variety. And that reckons to be the vehicle or the organ of Hollywood. So, in a sense, we're talking about from the base. And there was an article in Variety a couple of months ago which said that only 5% of people in the world, only 5%, actually watch cinema in cinemas. If any of us become associated with cinema practice, that means 95% of audiences in the world watch cinema now on smartphones, on DVDs, and television. Does that make it cinema? Or is that something else? You know, my grandfather went to cinema, I think, three times a week, and he went to a cinema where the screen was bigger than you are, and the soundtrack was noisier than you could ever be, and he went in company. When you watch cinema practice, either on smartphones, television, and DVD, you're probably on your own, or you're with your nearest and dearest in your front room, or maybe in your office. So is that cinema as well? Watching cinema on your own, or with a company, very few people, and also seeing it on a screen about that big, with sound that either if you're in company you have to listen through earphones, or indeed, if it's in your front room, I know we're all getting bigger and bigger and bigger televisions, but still it's got nothing to do, even with a screen as big as that. So aren't these two really good proofs that the cinema of our fathers and forefathers is no more? It's being, re I suppose, replicated by a much more personalized notion of uh, degrees of social media. 
And most of that social media is of a rather intimate nature. It's about what are you doing next Saturday night? Shall we meet at the pub tomorrow? Are you at your father's wedding, etc., etc., etc.? It's often an information of quite intimate personal nature, which on one level, the social level, of course, is very interesting, very exciting, very vulnerable. But it's got nothing to do with cinema, has it? It's not really got anything to do with cinema. So now after I've given you those two examples, you must surely at least a little more agree with me that cinema is dead. But there is a way, of course, that the desire for what I would call audio-visual experience is part of the human psyche and has always been so. And if you very quickly, rapidly, certainly in the West, I'm afraid I'm Eurocentric, so I cannot really talk about the East, but I rather suspect it's true of the East too, that, what should we say, at least 3,000 years ago in Greece, let's take early Greece, there was this extraordinary technology of amphitheaters which had amazing audio systems. It is said when you dropped a coin in the middle of a amphitheater in Athens, 5,000 people could hear it. The technology was so perfect. And then when Greece I succumbed, I suppose, to the Roman influence, the Romans, and you can go to Rome and it can be proven, created the biggest theatres that we've ever had. And we're very, very excited about the audiovisual situation, indeed, of a Roman theatrical performance. Then Constantine comes along and, I suppose, puts his arm around Christianity as a political act, and suddenly all that theatrical activity goes whoosh, into the Roman Catholic Church. So we have churches all over the Western world which are purveying this audiovisual excitement. Huge multimedia activity. Just think, in St. Peter's in Rome, there is music, there is light, there's colored glass, there's costumes, there's incense, there's everything you can think of that we now regard as part of multimedia. So don't think of multimedia as a contemporary phenomenon. The church organizes extremely well. And then in, what, 1350, 1400, somebody like a proto Monteverdi comes along and invents opera. And the whole association, this human desire for audio-visual excitement, moves very largely from ecclesiastical religion and churches into the opera houses. And you know opera houses, mostly, certainly in Italy, are all U-shaped. So they're deliberately made so the audience can see the audience. It's very interesting that all opera houses, until the invention of cinema, kept the lights up in the auditorium. And it was only after the invention of cinema that opera houses copied and started taking the lights down so the audience could no longer see the audience. That, of course, was the doom of opera, because people really went to an opera house to be seen. They were the performers as much as what was happening on stage. So that was the death knell for opera in a curious way. And they say, really, don't they, 1918, uh, the last year of the First World War, is the real cutting edge. The death of opera, and really the establishment all over the Western world, and probably all over the Eastern world too, of cinema. And then cinema took over the responsibilities of this desire in the human psyche for audio, visual, speculation, speculative entertainment. And now we're 120 years further on, and really 120 years which has moved very, very fast, which has really produced very, very little. I don't know if you're admirers of probably who is considered the most important contemporary American film director. I think it's still pitched at Scorsese, though Spielberg earns a lot more money, he's not really very well respected because of his vocabulary and his syntax. But there is a way I suppose Scorsese still is. I'm sure it's no accident that Scorsese really is a fallen Roman Catholic. He's interested in good and evil and continually makes the same film over and over and over again. <laughs> I do think, you know, there's a sad way that maybe Scorsese, however you might respect him, still basically makes the same films as W.G. Griffiths, who was working in 1910. The equipment is much more sophisticated. The publicity is huge. 
But essentially the grammar, the vocabulary, the syntax of cinema is exactly the same. So cinema has hardly produced anything of any value which could be described as innovative. There's one other phenomenon. The Americans sometimes say cinema invented the art of a glance, that close-up psychological language which is supposed to be a particular contribution of cinema to world culture. But if you look at the paintings of Van Eyck way back 1452, you will see already that the art of the glance is perfectly there. And certainly from the whole beginning of the Italian Renaissance, you can see the art of the glance constantly, constantly, especially in religious painting, especially in depictions of the Last Supper, always being employed. So I don't think that's a theory that we can pay much heed to. So isn't it strange? We've had a, we've had a cinema which had already manufactured 30 million films by 1929, and now must surely have manufactured, probably, I don't know, it's a hypothetical number, but certainly 5,000, 5, maybe even more, 10,000 million films in 120 years from, indeed, 1895. Um, I think, you know, every year now there are about 45 films created, what we might call film films, in Hollywood. So as many as that every single year. And that's just one center. Think of Bollywood, which probably does twice as many. And there are hundreds of other circles and film industries. You know, there's only one civilized cultural artifact that's moved faster than the internet. They reckon the internet was all over the world within three years. Cinema was invented in 1895. By 1905, 10 years, every country in the world has a film industry. It moved extraordinarily quickly. I think that's also to its detriment because everybody's basically ended up with the same sort of cinema. Film theorists would argue that Japanese cinema is different from English cinema. English cinema is different from, I don't know, where should I posit some other phenomenon? But basically, those differences are very, very slight. If you take painting, for example, Japanese painting is very, very different from Renaissance European painting because it takes so long to evolve. The evolving process has been part of that richness. But these phenomena, which are created virtually overnight, end up being globally the same. So I think maybe that, in some senses, is detrimental. There is a way, then, that you can see that I am somewhat disenchanted about cinema. There were a whole series of apologists, probably in the 1910s, 1920s. Maybe you've heard of some of them. Um, there was uh, several Belgians and several uh, French people, especially a Belgian called Bazin, who suggested the cinema was really a mix, an unhealthy mix, a hybrid mongrel mix between the theater, literature, and if you're very, very lucky, some painting. And I don't think it's changed at all. You could very, very easily deconstruct cinema back down into literature, theater, and occasionally with certain visionaries, people like Eisenstein, maybe even people like Ridley Scott, you might find that a surprising name coming from me, but there is certainly a great sense of visualization by that Hollywood director. And of course, we'd have to include people like Fellini, people who do think visually rather than simply illustrating notions of text. So I think, you know, there is certainly an English uh, proverb, I suppose, you could call it a proverb, that if people don't think a thing is broken, they will not try to mend it. I can see two scientists there nodding at me, so they can obviously absolutely agree that they're in the business of novelty and continual reinvention. But all artists ought to be in the business of reinvention. And there are very, very few filmmakers who really do comply with, I think, that particular obligation. Okay, but it's no good complaining and complaining about a defunct and dead and hardly formed embryonic cinema, especially since it's now dead. We have to think <coughs> positively and find what we're going to put in its place. I don't think you're going to see interesting cinema ever again in places like this. I think cinema, or cinema, or so the architecture of cinema, already has been deleterious, has been inimical to the showing of films. Look at you. In a minute, the lights are going to go out. 
you're going to be in the dark. What on earth are you doing in the dark? You are not nocturnal animals. You do not have nictating eyelids. You do not have the physiology to see in the dark. We only see in the dark very, very poorly, but we have apparently created this art form where you have to be in the dark, or you used to have to be in the dark. The imagery now is so extraordinarily sophisticated, you can actually watch cinema in the noonday sun in Naples, and it will really work. So the notion of having to be in the dark, again, is passé, we've moved on. But think of the other characteristics. Look at you all. This is not really a proper cinema, is it? It doesn't really have a raked floor, so the people at the back uh, still have difficulty looking over the heads of the people in front of them. This, of course, is a theatrical device, and certainly true in opera houses, maybe especially true in opera houses, where they build all the seats all the way up the walls. And the third thing is, most films now last about 120 minutes didn't used to. Time of Charlie Chaplin's two readers, they were only about 45 minutes. They got longer and longer and longer. And of course, if your name is Scorsese or certainly Spielberg, you can now afford to make a film of nearly three hours long. But that is somewhat exceptional. So what are you doing? Sitting in the dark, looking in one direction, and also being obliged to sit still. I bet you in your beds last night, and I'm not indicating any peculiar practices. In your beds last night, your body, your physiology, was constantly on the move. It's part of the energy and the notion, indeed, of the way uh, we've been anatomically arranged and evolved, that the body is always alive. You know, uh, way back in the 1950s, there were films, I think, made in Czechoslovakia, uh, which uh, concentrated on drivers' eyes, car drivers, and it was absolutely amazing to see this because the eyes were never still. The only time your eyes are still is when you're dead. And the actual notion, again, of a body which is 360 degrees, like you, I have a gyroscopic head which is never, ever still. And so the idea of the creation of a frame, which is absolutely the essence of cinema, I think the dominance of the frame, which is a still static image, even though the camera might be moving within it, is totally, totally artificial. It doesn't exist anywhere in nature. No animal ever sees in fixed notions of a singularity of a single frame. So we have created the cinema, I suppose, entirely upon this rather lazy notion, this sort of comfort zone convenience which I suppose has evolved slowly, maybe coming, I suppose, from the notions of the invention of the photograph. You can't really blame it on the theatre because the theatre is a three-dimensional living phenomenon. You can't base it on the opera house for the same reasons. Which also made me make another observation. This space is a single aisle. Most cinemas don't have an aisle in the middle, so I'll make an approximation. The gentleman there with the beard is the only man, he's sitting probably in G12 in a conventional cinema, so he's the only man who has a good seat. The rest of you can go home. <laughs> because he, not quite, because he ought to be a little to his right, but he is sitting where the cameraman was sitting when he took the picture. And cinema is a two-dimensional phenomenon, despite James Cameron and Abbott. I mean, the notion of a three-dimensional cinema is really rather crazy when you think about it. But you can't say that about cinema, or, I mean, you can't say that about theatre, you can't say that about opera, because even though the stage in opera and theatre might be very shallow, that lady over there who's looking me in the eye, and that lady over there who's fidgeting, both have got good seats, because the theatrical and the operatic experience is three dimensions. You won't see exactly the same thing, but probably you'll say, see something which is equally interesting. So I think that uh, that notion of the idea of this particular cinema we have created is full of all sorts of conventions which, like McLuhan said, the medium is the message, is very relevant to the way in which you watch cinema. But, 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 as we've suggested, all this is changing very, very rapidly. 
undermining what we had thought about as public cinema seen en masse in big spaces, such that you know there is necessarily a way in which we have to reinvent the medium, and almost without trying, and even if you're all nostalgics and love Casablanca, and like to fall asleep in cinemas in the dark, I'm sorry, you're losing out. You're old-fashioned, you belong in a museum. <laughs> what are you going to do about this? Well, I think, you know, it's absolutely implicit. There is a great process of reinvention, reinvention, reinvention. Just like we explained, I tried to explain the sort of history of the audiovisual experience. And, um, there is a way I would like, I don't know whether you would like, but I would like to be part of that reinvention process. And I want to get away or reconsider all those characteristics which heretofore have been part of what we regard cinema as once upon a time being. I'm going to make a really pompous statement now. What I want to make is present tense, multi-screen, non-narrative cinema. Three mountains to climb, which are very, very difficult for most people to become associated with. After all, I suppose most people, am I, not, am I not correct? Most people go to the cinema to be told a story. What a waste of time. <laughs> cinema is very bad at telling stories. That's why it always goes back to the bookshop for its material. Cinema hardly ever creates its own material. It's borrowing it from another medium. I don't know whether it's borrowing it very well, because if you think, if you believe that cinema is allowed or permitted or even encouraged to do this, we should say then that if you take the very, very best literature and the very most contemporary literature, that's around. But most of our cinema is really based on 19th century literature, or all the way back to Jane Austen. How many versions of Jane Austen films have you seen? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And then you think about inside of Charles Dickens or his reductions of Shakespeare. And it's very largely, you know, by, uh, I suppose, by the year about 1850, the number of writers of profundity who are getting illustrated by cinema become less and less and less. And you are the city of Borges. And there have been a number of Borges films which have all been extremely bad because it's impossible to make films about magic realism. As soon as you make magic realism visual, it loses its magic. Magic realism essentially is a literary trope. It's very much to do with words and not to do with pictures. That's one of the reasons why I think there have been so many very bad Borges uh, films so far. But again, if you know you really want to be able to illustrate literature, you know, where, where, where is Borges in a sense? Where is Perak? Where is Wellebeck? Where are all those people who are now writing contemporary notions of, should we say, literary literature? So I think that argument very largely falls down if you really want to regard cinema as being a very, very modernist institution. But again, I don't think it's a very good idea making that jump. We have to cut the umbilical cord between the notions of the cinema and the bookshop and start making something which is truly autonomously, I believe, cinema cinema. How do we do that? Well, there are all sorts of ways and means which are very much relative to the new technologies, which that's for general sense of people, the digital visual revolution. Microsoft virtually invents something every afternoon. It's very, very difficult to keep up. I have a huge number of collaborators. I live in Amsterdam, and Rotterdam is supposed to be one of the centers in Europe of the invention, if you like, of visual literate technology. I have a lot of associates, most of them under 25, in Rotterdam who are inventing engines for me, touch screens, ways and means of pushing and pulling the cinematic vocabulary into all sorts of new exciting areas. I will try and make a demonstration of some of those things now, and I think that my preoration, my prologue, to posit myself so that you might understand where I come from, should now be over, and I should show you some evidence. And what I'd like to do is to trek through, I suppose, uh, uh, characteristics of the digital visual revolution and see how they can be explored. 
I'm not offering you any definitive statements. It's all experimental work, I hope, of the highest, highest quality. And here I have to make an interjection. The facilities for showing films in this room is very, very bad. We now have visual possibilities with 8K photography of seeing mice on the moon. Just imagine that. The state of the art now is about 4K, and most of the products that I've been showing you are related to that very, very high photographic resolution. You're all aware of Blu-ray, etc., etc. So probably a domestic situation, and you know how photographic, cinematic, post-cinematic technology is extraordinarily good. I'm afraid you won't see it here. Um, people have apologized to me. Again, maybe, I don't know, you're supposed to be a scientifically organized uh, university, but maybe your business doesn't fall into the notion of this machine hanging at the bottom of uh, this pole here, but I rather suggest it's all related. So poor sound, poor picture, poor focus. But I hope enough to be able to try and explain to you what I would like to see happen. The first thing that I'm always interested in, and that's sort of the way we talked about it before, here is a screen. It is a parallelogram, it has four right angles, and it's ubiquitous all over the world. It doesn't have to be a parallelogram, it doesn't have to be a rectangle, it could be any shape we choose. Present technology doesn't even need it to be flat. It can be a mobile, it could be a liquid surface, it can even project on steam and air and rain. So this object of convenience and comfort zone is really very, very archaic. But we've got to begin somewhere. About four years ago, I was invented, I was invited by a Milan um, Design Institute, um, uh, built by Mussolini, which of course is not entirely irrelevant, uh, to make some experimentation to a view of showing and making a presentation of Italian design. I suggested we should be much more emboldened, but um, audience spans in the exhibition aren't very long, so I couldn't afford to make something that was very big, so I think they gave me about seven minutes. Mr. Greenaway explained Italian design in seven minutes in a way that Italian design would like to be explained. That's no longer on a flat disk screen. So, I've called this particular thing Pompeii to Mussolini, when I showed it in Italy, they rather objected to me showing the word Mussolini, but I use that as an example of historical period, not as extreme right-wing politics. First of all, I wanted to have multiple screens. As we walk down the street to come to this presentation, your eye is constantly moving. As we said, there's no such thing as a frame in nature, so let's break everything up. Let's try and find a way that the projection you manufacture is relative to the screen on which you put it, which virtually doesn't exist anywhere, does it? You see Casablanca and Mickey Mouse and Sinking the Titanic all on the same space, which really is a reduction which has an absurdity to it. So what I first wanted to do is to make a very, very large screen and to indicate how large it is, we have a little communist red adult six foot figure. It gives you a sense of his politics, but also a sense of the scale. This is very, very big. All right, most of traditional architecture and cinema, certainly places like this, are all about horizontals and verticals of the grid. So um, I wanted to break that by creating something which is very Italian. There must be Italians in the audience, yes? There are, even if you're not Italian now, your grandparents were. And you know, it's the Italians who invented the triumphal arch, with all its pomposity, with all its specularity. So if I'm gonna make grand drama, I really ought to put it on a triumphal arch. So I built a screen the shape of a triumphal arch. And here's the question, indeed, of the grid. If I am interested in horizons, the widest possible, which is much wider than the cinema screen, and of course it's related to the horizon, isn't it, of the sea predominantly, which can always guarantee to give you an absolute flat horizon. And since I must also parallel that with its opposite as a vertical, it's interesting, isn't it, that the whole of God-made and man-made civilization is contained within 10 kilometers 
about two kilometers underneath the Earth's surface, basically, and maybe, I don't know, a kilometer, two kilometers above Mount Everest. Very, very thin slice. But there is a way also that I've created, I suppose, basically a trapezium shape here, but I'm trying to give you an example in two dimensions, and we're talking three dimensions. I've given it a talk on the top to make a demonstration that these screens, as I suggested before, don't have to be flat to your parallel viewing plane, they can be twisted. So consider the size is huge. It's arranged so you can see screens through screens through screens, and all the screens themselves are now associated with this new technology that I can make that screen totally transparent, like a clean plate of glass, or I can occlude it. I can make it absolutely uh, opaque. And I can do that, as they say, on the fly. So when you're actually watching the films, the screens themselves can maneuver between transparency and being absolutely flat and dead. And since I have an awful lot to say, I've also given myself three small footnote screens. So I have, what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven screens on which to make a display of what might very well be the future of cinema. So go back to my particular desire to make multi-screen cinema on the present tense without narrative. It's very expensive, of course, but then all things get very, very cheap very, very quickly. Look at the price of your laptop. If you afforded one, I suppose, 15 years ago, I think I've had a laptop for about 18 years now. I think, you know, they've got ridiculously cheap to almost be giveaway, like giveaway newspapers. Remember also about the scale and the fact that you're not going to be seated and you can take up any point you like so you can wander around this sculptural artifact and, as it were, have that ubiquity of not always being as you are now, including the man who has the good seat, actually in a fixed position. We don't have to be seated to watch cinema. That's another thing which we should blow away and you can see it's happening in expos all around the world. All right. Then, in terms of the content, I've suggested to you it's a history of Italian design. I had to find a start point, and I chose AD 70, which is the time that Pompeii was excavated, to reveal, I suppose, the extraordinary excitement of Roman painting. And I was told not to include living designers, because Italian living designers are very competitive, and if I were to leave somebody out, they will be hell to play. So I had to finish virtually at the end of the Second World War. That's why I mentioned Mussolini. You will recognize immediately this is the old, um, I suppose, continuum of Western art for the last 2,000 years. You will see, you know, you will see Gothic art, you will see the Renaissance, you will see Baroque, you will see Rococo, etc. And we'll also move with the technology from fresco painting to photography. Have a look and see what we did. So quickly turn the lights down very low. Cinema works best of all in a conventional way in absolute darkness. <laughs>
relative to the human body. That's why, indeed, uh, we give you an encyclopedic uh, vision of the notion of the movements and presence of the naked human body throughout the whole history of design. Here's something which still, again, deals with the notion, uh, perhaps on a much more serious level, with the ideas of cinematic accumulation, about cinema as a documentary truth, about creating, indeed, statistics about this extraordinary phenomenon that in the first, I suppose, 20 years of the nuclear world, over 2,000 bombs were dropped on the planet Earth. That was relative to the time when we regarded the atomic bomb as deterrent, so everybody had to know we had it. I think after 1991, it became very um, politically unrequired that uh, we should advertise our atomic presence, and most atomic bombs were still being dropped, but certainly went underground, and that's timely, certainly in secret. Take a look at this.
of the projection here, we continue to make a criticism, we'll see that um, all the docu documentation, the strength of the bomb, who was responsible for dropping it, where it was dropped, latitude and longitude, etc., etc., are all contained in what really could be described, I suppose, as an archetypal document, so really, truly a documentary film and related indeed, I suppose, to my desire to make some sense of present tense, non-narrative, uh, multi-screen filmmaking. I haven't been given an awful lot of time here and I have an awful lot to show you, so I'm going to pick and choose from the various items that I wanted to, to tell you, and I'm actually going to move very fast now through these composers. Uh, in, uh, I suppose, what, about 10 years ago, there was an invitation by the BBC to make a series of documentaries about contemporary music. And my particular desire was to construct the films in the same way that the composers constructed their music. Like, for example, John Cage constructed a lot of his music by chance operation. And uh, the other uh, composers who were involved in this quartet of films likewise had particular individual subjective ways of organizing the music. Um, I give you three examples, and there are many, many more, of various ways in which the digital revolution, of course, is not entirely superseding the celluloid cinema, but there are things that we can do with the notions of archiving, collection, the documentary versus fictional filmmaking, and certainly the manipulation that the first film I showed, you can imagine how complex the different sizes of screens were all interconnected on a computer basis. And you can see this last film required a huge amount of synchronization to make the whole phenomenon work. It could indeed have been created in the celluloid cinema, but uh, the notions of the digital potential um, have greatly increased our strength of fulfilling vocabulary. Let me show you something else which is related to time. Goddard famously said that 
The cinema is the truth, 24 frames a second. He was, of course, being ironic and pulling our leg. But if you want to try and find a way to put computerized cinema in association with real time, like, for example, in the playing of music, you have great difficulties because no piece of live music is ever played exactly the same twice over. We were uh, invited by Lloyds of London, who have a huge skyscraper, like a secular skyscraper in the city of London, uh, to use it, in a sense, as our auditorium, where we put up a whole series of um, uh, screens, again, using the idea of multiple shapes to fit the material on which was projected. But we included two new other phenomena, which are deeply associated with digital revolution. One was the notion of real-time calligraphy, and the other was the notion of the touch screen. Both inventions uh, put together for me by all these extraordinary whiskeys in Rotterdam in Holland. Let me, before I tell you any more, show you what we did. Remember, this is a film record of a live performance, and rather like the first diagrams I showed you, it's trying to put three dimensions into two dimensions. Okay, it needs to be explained that the text for this, think about Lloyds of London, who used to insure the Titanic, are still a big ship insurers, so witness the ironic title, Walking on Water. And the actual text was taken from three of the greatest literary uh, pieces of fiction in the English language, which are uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest, Coleridge's uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and Melville's Moby Dick.
20 minutes, we don't have time to see it all, but you can see and understand how real-time calligraphy, fixed uh, typography, live music, and the bits of uh, projecting on irregular screens could all be brought together again as part indeed of the very sophisticated language of what's now possible in cinema. Something, of course, which you hardly ever see in mainstream cinema, but there are bits and pieces of this vocabulary which are gradually spreading, of course, about all notions of new cinematic <coughs> ideas. The architecture is by Richard Rogers, and the music is by David Lang, a third generation minimalist coming out of New York. So again, an excuse for all sorts of really first-rate people to come together in order to make an artwork. Here's something different. I've always felt that the way we genreize, if I can use that as a verb, our cinema. You know, there's a way that the feature film, the documentary, the chase movie, the tearjerker, etc. And even further afield, thinking of McLuhan's The Medium is a Message, the cartoon as rarely seen with live action, and um, the notion of animation and the idea of painting and cinema having a concatenation and sharing responsibilities. And for me, this um, film is also very much, I suppose, I really thoroughly enjoy working with dancers and architects. They're the only people who really, truly understand space, the notions of gravity, ideas of weight and weightlessness. And here we're working with a French dance team, indeed on a project which again was inaugurated by the BBC, where they reverse the normal cinematic phenomenon, where you know basically the images are made first and the music is added afterwards. But here a series of European composers were asked to indeed envisage a celebration, of course, of the great of Mozart. Uh, I think was celebrating his birth, I believe it was his birth and not his death. And they all set out to write pieces of music under the aegis of that particular commission. And then they invited filmmakers of their interest to come along and find an image correspondence. Take a look at this. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, you can see indeed the concatenation of typography, calligraphy, dance, painting, and also, I suppose, an advance on Walt Disney with a particular association with the combined a combination of live action and animation. This will surprise you. I don't know what members of the audience remember. There was a film several years back now called Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Are you all familiar with that? It was considered to be one of the very first attempts to combine live action, indeed, with animation. For an extraordinary six months, about 10 years ago, no, it must be more than that, 15 years ago, I had a Hollywood uh, agent who looked after my career. It didn't last very long because it was absolutely disastrous. They kept sending me huge numbers of scripts which were entirely, I suppose, uh, irrelevant to what I wanted to do. But one of those scripts, I was the first director to be asked to make the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> there are various things I'd like to show you, but we're running out of time. But I would like just maybe, because you might be asking yourself, well, what about this experiment and that experiment, and, and how do you utilize it, shall we say, in notions of, shall we say, off mainstream cinema, but also mainstream cinema? I recently um, completed the film about the great Soviet uh, film director Sergei Eisenstein. In 1929, he was encouraged by Stalin to go to Hollywood to learn about sound cinema. I have to say he came back not knowing very much about it because that wasn't primarily his interest. But he did eventually um, get to Hollywood, a total um, disaster, made no films at all for all sorts of reasons, which I'm sure you will certainly understand. Hollywood almost certainly cannot handle intellectuals. But then he went on to Mexico. I shouldn't say this in front of you, but I always think of, I suppose, Latino Mexican speakers somehow are curiously related to, indeed, the South American <coughs> continent. Um, the, uh, I suppose, sojourn in Mexico away from dialectical materialism and the heavy-handed Stalin freed uh, the great Russian film director from so many of, should we say, I wouldn't actually say his hang-ups, but the personifications indeed of living indeed in Soviet Russia. And um, I wanted to indeed make a film about his um, uh, attempts to make a Mexican film called Que Viva Mexico. It was again unfinished, he was never allowed to edit it. So we made an extremely edited film, almost as a homage to the great um, uh, cinema maker. There's a certain sort of irony here at a time, I think, when cinema is dying, as I've been trying to explain to you, we should celebrate the greatest film director, I believe, ever. So let me just show you the introduction to this film, and then uh, we will open up for uh, any of you who might like to ask some questions. Just excuse me while I whip through some material I would love to have shown you, but we do not have time. I will hope to be able to show some of this uh, material in some great cumulative projects we're now currently involved in uh, tomorrow, indeed, when I'm given uh, another large space to talk to people. I'm almost there. Um, <coughs>
In 1931, the Russian film director, Sergei Eisenstein, traveled to Mexico to make a film. It was tentatively to be called Que Viva Mexico. Eisenstein had a worldwide fame based on the reputation of only three films, all made in Soviet Russia. Strike, a violent tale of civilian unrest, viciously crushed by authority. The battleship Potemkin, a violent account of a naval mutiny over rotten meat. And October, a violent celebration of the Russian Revolution. In the West, the film October was called Ten Days That Shook the World. This present film might be called Ten Days That Shook Eisenstein.